Thank you, everybody. I knew this was going to be a super popular talk. I'm very excited. So um, this is the panel on augmented and mixed reality. What we're going to have today is super cool, smart people working on different aspects in the, in the space. Each one of them, we're going to have a conversation. It's just a bunch of super geek, uh, smart, cool people talking about the, what they're passionate about. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you are, you are. So, and each one of them is approaching it from a different point of view. So we are going to be seeing different perspectives here. So I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, I am Dio Gonzalez, a principal engineer at Unity Labs. I'm currently leading the mixed reality research group. Now, before I pass it on to my panelists, uh, I want, I'm not, I promise, I'm not going to give you a lecture. Uh, but I wanted to set the context and um, the, the, the terminology of the talk today. Uh, because as you know, mixed reality has been misunderstood or misinterpreted, um, thinking that is a green screen for streaming virtual reality experiences. That is not what we're talking about today. Uh, this figure that I'm showing there is the, from the paper in 1994 that first introduced the term mixed reality, and they refer to as that continuum of experiences between the purely physical world on one side and the purely um, synthetic virtual experiences on the other side. So again, Today, we're going to be, you're going to be hearing us saying augmented reality, mixed realities. Uh, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about green screen in VR. So with that, let us get ahead. We're going to have first all of our panelists introducing themselves, what they do so we can, uh, they can educate us on their work in their particular companies and their work. And here's the clicker. Which button? <laughs> Hi, I'm Jerry Ellsworth. Uh, I've been a lifelong inventor. Uh, worked on many consumer products, uh, had the honor of starting the Valve Software Hardware R&D department, which um, ultimately produced the Steambox and the Vive uh, VR system. And that's where I got my first introduction to augmented reality. And I, I got my first taste of it and realized that's exactly what I wanted to chase after. So uh, we spun out Cast AR from Valve um, to pursue it on our own, Rick Johnson and I. Uh, what we are creating is a turnkey uh, AR headset and platform that's self-contained that will be able to deliver content and present content. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up uh, the, the whole spectrum because even when I was at Valve, it was really murky what it was all about. If you ask my, my nieces, this is probably what they'll say AR is about and it's, it's super fun. Um, but you know what's exciting is we're seeing a shift in the market right now. Uh, uh, different AR um, platforms becoming bigger and more popular. And even my father mentioned Pokemon Go. And uh, that was exciting for me since he's not particularly technical. Um, a lot of people are talking about um, camera-based AR is going to be our future. I think that's, it's going to be a very vigorous and vibrant part of it. And it's going to help move the industry along. But what we're working on is making glasses the actual platform that's going to be consumer focused. And it takes a multi prong approach. You're going to have to make it at a price point that people are going to um, be able to afford it. You're going to have to make it in uh, such a form factor where you don't have to be hanging sensors on your wall or moving your furniture out of your living room. And you're going to have to provide all the input to the, the system so that it's um, very easy. And of course, needs to uh, run on Unity so you have a great tool set. So this is a quick video that shows kind of what the experience should look like when you get the cast system. So you have your eyewear, you have an input wand device which you can carve through 3D space. You can reach in with your hands and um, interact with the graphics direct directly. And we have cameras for machine vision where we can wrap real world objects with graphics. And the, the way that we've made it a friction-free experience is we can find everything to a projection surface, which is a really clever material that directs the light to each user. So um, if you're a developer and interested in getting one of our de developer kits, you could reach out to us here, or if you can follow my shenanigans, you can uh, reach me anywhere at Jerry Ellsworth. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back. Good. Oh, there we go. 
Um, how many uh, developers, engineers, programmers do we have here? Okay, I'm going to go back and do a bit of a technical talk um, <laughs> that uh, I'm normally out here telling you about all the creative things that we're up to, but this is very technical, so I'm going to do it from back here and we'll... we'll push the button. Oh, push my little... Oh, I like it, but it's not... Buttons do not... Uh, we have a button. clicker. Good. Let's make sure it's going to actually run. No, it's not up there. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. So, anybody here want to go to Mars? <laughs> Got some Mars enthusiasts? The UAR project is Bent's mission to Mars. It's a moonshot to make ubiquitous AR a reality. Three years ago, our ideas were too early for the existing platforms. So we set out to see if we can make the tech ourselves. We believe that persistent augmented reality and mixed reality is about to change the world. Content and experiences that stay where you put them are going to be key to social AR. So we asked ourselves some questions. What if developers had access to an AR platform that incorporated a precise geomap for accurately placing AR content anywhere in the world, creating persistent content? What if it enabled rapid asset deployment to devices, te testers, and the world from their IDE, and was hardware convergent and hardware agnostic? And what if users had access? What if users had access to an AR platform that had the ability to allow more than one application to run at a time, enabled social sharing by allowing for multi-user, multiplayer interaction? and also allowed the users to mash up the AR content and the experiences themselves, and also permissively allowed applications to interact with each other, swapping assets such as geometry or even logic on the fly. Persistent AR, what is that? It's AR content that stays exactly where you put it and is part of a worldwide web of experiences that are available to be remixed and reshaped by others. I'm talking about a platform that embraces experiences that do not disappear and content that can live in the past, the present, and the future. How do you do this? We're using a precise geomap system with the capability to position all object types to an accuracy of less than one millimeter while maintaining a single precision rendering pipeline, a system that incorporates very efficient database queries and horizontal scaling of the cloud services. We know that limits of users, um, you know, if you can't move around, it destroys the immersion. Sorry, guys. Um, so we developed Rova CV that locates a specific device position and pose in 3D, 3D meet space, creating a node that functions as an anchor point. We relate this node to a known system positional construct we call a trackable. For us, the word trackable is going to be in a lot of places. Uh, in this way, the device adds location data to the system, improving our trackable and becomes aware of other AR content in the area before the AR content enters the device FOV. This gives users real freedom of movement. I apologize, I'm having a little trouble getting down my text here. The implication of this may not be obvious. It's a self-organizing, self-enhancing web where each user interaction improves the accuracy of the geomap and the content uh, to interact with it. What does this mean? It means that you're able to walk from one AR location without losing your real-world AR orientation, and the next piece of content that you're interested in seeing that should be just around the corner is there when you get there. When our global canvas system is finished, it will allow trillions of pieces of AR content to be accurately matched to billions of locations in the real world. When assets are built out from our system, they're instantly available to be downloaded on any supported OS. We are extending the developer's streaming capabilities by automating them from the project level. Using our system, developers do not have to specifically support asset streaming 
as we detect the assets, bundle them up, streamline the data for our pipeline. This means that users get to communicate with AR and each other through these developer applications in real time. For us, ubiquitous AR means social AR with user-driven content and experiences. User interaction is an umbrella term that applies to a wide breadth of issues. Uh, breadth of issues. It covers the user interaction of our system, to our developer apps, to content discovery, and the social sharing metaphors we know and use every day. And UAR has the ability to run more than one application at a time. With permissions, you can throw a ball from one app and knock something down in another. It's something we've been working on for a while and we thought was really needed. You guys know in the app space, siloed apps just do not work very well for long-term um, companies. With UR, you don't write a Tango application or a monocular AR application, you write a UR application. When you do, you automatically leverage the capabilities of the device you're running on. This allows you to target the largest user base, enable the best feature set, and an added benefit if you de develop an AR experience on the UAR platform using a Tango device, billions, billions of current cell phones will also be able to participate. Augmented reality will be the disruptive technology that po powers the next generation of the internet. Each of you will have a thousand ideas that we never had, and they'll all be good ideas. It's a new space. Together, we can build a WWW of AR. So tell us what tools you need to make your vision come true and join our mission to Mars. Thanks. <laughs> it was a bit technical, so the delivery wasn't as good as it could have been, but uh, hopefully you guys got the information. Another version of your, there we go. There we All right, hey guys. Uh, I'm Ed Tang, I'm the founder of Alvagant, and you guys probably know us in the past for shipping a product called the Glyph. We've actually uh, been working a lot in the retinal projection space, and now we've recently started to, to come public around some of the transparent mixed reality display technologies we're working on, specifically in the light field space. And some of you may uh, have heard of light field displays, some of you may not. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, um, and why it's so critical for, our, uh, for the future of our industry. You know, end of the day, we think about, you know, why does light field matter? Why is this such a critical uh, technology for the future of, of these experiences in this industry? Well, I think a lot of us, most of you are developers out here, so um, I'm going to dive into the science just a little bit, so bear with me. But we've probably seen a lot of experiences like this, right, where you can put on an AR device today, and it's pretty, pretty interesting, pretty good experience, but the second that you want to get close to some of these objects, you want to hold an object in your hand, the whole experience kind of falls apart. Right? You kind of get an experience like that, where you can look at the object or you can look at your hand, but it never really matches each other. Right? So you think about these close-up close interactions, talk about like uh, real object overlay on top of uh, objects kind of near, near to you, and that becomes a really big problem. And there's kind of two, two sides to this coin, okay? You've got, uh, let's say, unrealistic overlay, just things look unrealistic in general, uh, and you have a lot of discomfort uh, to the eye. And discomfort in, I would say, AR and mixed reality is different than what we see in VR, right? In VR, you think, you think of things like nausea and, and motion sickness, but in AR, you, have, you see things like eye strain and headaches and things like that. Um, but these are two separate problems that uh, have to be addressed, and these are both addressed with, uh, with light field technologies. And diving into the science a little bit behind like why these two problems exist, so if we first talk about the unrealism of, of objects uh, in these transparent displays, when you try to bring in re uh, virtual objects into your real world, why do they look unrealistic to you? Well, it all comes down to how do we actually see depth? And some of you might have seen this before. You know, we talk, start looking at vision science, it's actually pretty well known at this point. But we start thinking about how do we see how far an object away is from us? And there's a bunch of different uh, visual cues, and they're kind of split up between close the close space or the, or the near space or the far space. And we have things like occlusion, we've got motion parallax, um, we've got uh, binocular disparity. It looks like the formatting is a little bit screwed up here. Uh, but up close, we have this really critical space that we look at, which is the accommodation and convergence space. Basically, the angle of our eyes versus the focus of our eyes, right? And these things have to be coupled very tightly together. And when you start thinking about the mixed reality space, most of the experiences we have are happening in this space, you know, in this kind of sub-10 meter space, which means 
the, the depth you see using focus, using your accommodation, and using convergence has to be matched to all the other parameters that we see. And if it's not matched, things start looking wrong, right? And that really limits the type of experiences that we can have. Likewise, when we start thinking about the discomfort side of things, you know, we, we, a lot of us, I think, are familiar with the VR space, and we understand that there's this accommodation convergence disparity, basically a mismatch between our focus and our convergence. But if you, you, there's actually this tolerance that, that, that uh, as humans, we can actually sustain that actually doesn't make us feel that, feel that bad, but this kind of breaks down again. So if you look at the real world, which is everything is correct, right? If I look at you, you're, you're five meters from me, my eyes are focused at five meters, I'm converged at five meters, the world is good. Um, that's why the real world feels, com feels comfortable to us all the time. But it's actually well known like how far away we can deviate from the real world and still feel comfortable. And this is up here as we call the comfort zone. Right? And you can see that when you're beyond about a meter or two, there's actually a really large gamut, a really large range that you can be wrong. Right? You can be wrong and still feel relatively okay. And this is where most of things like 3D TVs, 3D movies, most VR experiences fall into that space. But when you start thinking about kind of the mixed reality space, you're within this sub one meter space. Right? This is where things start really falling apart. And you notice that there's very, very little tolerance for error in that space. So when we start thinking about the type of experiences that we want to create, you can't tolerate those type of errors, right? And we've, what we've done is we've developed a new technology. It's a new way to generate a light field, okay? And this technology effectively can generate simultaneous multifocal planes such that an image that you show is always in the correct focal distance, right? And that sounds really technical, but at the end of the day, what that means is it delivers a really great and realistic experience that doesn't give you that kind of eye strain, right? So that example that I saw before was, is going to start looking more like that. You know, you put your hand out and you really get this experience where it actually feels like there's a real object in your hand, almost indistinguishable from, from, uh, from the real world around it. And simultaneously having objects in the background, as many as you want, and just like real objects, I can pick and choose and focus on any of these objects and they feel incredibly realistic, comfortable, and natural to me. And these are the type of experiences that I want, right? And when you start thinking about... Um, uh, people are talking about AR and MR really changing the world, right? And no matter what industry you think about in the consumer space, in the enterprise space, almost any application that you're thinking about, um, most of those experiences that we, we, we imagine are actually happening up pretty close, right? Think about like overlaying something on, an, on a tool in front of me to fix it, or me having a conversation with my child next to me, or interacting with her playing these toys, right? Or interacting with other user interface uh, elements around my hands. You know, I think a lot of these early, early adoption type products, which, um, which show kind of the promise of where things are going, are still pretty limited in the type of experiences we think about. Pinning things to walls, right? Looking at things far away. Ultimately, we want to have this really intimate experience with, with, uh, with our data, with, with the people that we want to see in the virtual world and the objects that we have. And that's why light fields, at the end of the day, is going to be required for the experience that our users demand. So we think about like, the potential of the growth of this market, the type of experiences that you guys as developers want to create. You don't want to be limited by the display technologies that are out there today and the products that are out there today. You really want to be able to put anything you want in the real world to create the type of experiences that are really compelling for ultimately the application you're looking for. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Let's keep talking about the tech a little more. Um, so all of you are approaching and developing on different hardware and or software. So, um, and they come from different, different perspectives, different point of view. So why do you think that what you're working on is the tech that is the present and the future of MR? Well, the tech that we're working on is something that can be shipped immediately. So I think that's very important. It's the the first baby step into AR that's available for everyone. You know, the, the reason we opted with using a reflective surface and a self-contained unit is to have a zero friction user experience. You know, someone non-technical like my father could flip open the board, hit the power button, have an, a close-up intimate experience the way we've designed it. That's just a transition technology. We do recognize that light field is gonna be essential when you try to lift off the table and you start moving around your home and start to embed your AR experience. And so uh, we feel that's very important as well. And then eventually, you know, in the next decade, when we start mapping the entire world and we start moving around the world, we're really gonna have to have 
you know, amazing sensors, amazingly efficient processing, and amazing uh, light field displays. For our part, we are very happy that these guys are working on hardware. Uh, because whatever hardware comes out, the best hardware, we'll, we'll be able to use that. Uh, we just felt like when we started that, um, I think all of us started with kind of a vision to inspire people and to be able to make cool interactions and do surrealism and realism. And what we found is that the tech wasn't there to do that. You couldn't actually land a dragon on a table. You couldn't actually have it go behind things. So we started working on that. And as we were doing that, we thought, this is cool. but. To have an experience that expires the minute you turn off your device and goes away, we realized that that really wasn't a long-term solution. That really wasn't a social situation. So we figured, well, the first thing we should really work hard on is figuring out how to put stuff in the world that stays there, that you can find again, that you can transport to other locations. Um, so that's why we're working on the platform. And one of the things I was saying the other day is that look at Pokemon Go. If they had a social platform that went with that and they had more than one user in it, and if it was just a minor thing, like you were down by the river and other people were doing it and somebody captured something and you kind of knew them or wanted to contact them and you could just message them and say, hey, I saw you at the river, you caught this particular Pokemon when I was there, that's social. And that platform would still be going. I think it's awesome. Like we love uh, innovative software platforms, and I think Jerry really admire like trying to go out and get the consumer market is, is a pretty tough challenge. It's amazing that you can find this stepping stone to try to get out in the market, which I, I think is great until some of these other technologies become more mature, right? And I think when we look at the light field space, you know, I think we we everyone in the industry today understands how critical of a technology it is. It's like people, the AR space and the MR space is kind of like people inventing the TV, right? And we have these black and white TVs, and I feel like light field is color to the black and white TV. Once you have it, you're never gonna go back. The type of experiences you have are, are at a different level uh, than without it, right? And I think if you guys go out and see some of the media, we've recently gone public with it, and actually we're on the front page of Engadget right now, if you look at some of the, the recent reviews. It's pretty interesting to see that, see how much light field adds to that technology. Um, and the way we approach the market is like, We've always kind of taken pride in ourselves and the challenge of building hardware is, uh, you, you, you know this, and, and you're probably happy you're not doing hardware. <laughs> it's really hard to make hardware, right? It's really, really challenging. Um, the, the approach that we take has always been a pragmatic approach. You know, we're no strangers to bringing brand new display technologies and trying to turn them into actual production, mass manufacturer type technologies and products. Um, and that's ex exactly what we're going to do with Lightfield. And I think the industry has looked at Lightfield and thought that, yes, it's a great technology, yes, it's amazing and you need it, but people have generally thought that it was two, three, five years away, and uh, we've recently come out and started sharing with the public that you know, it's, it's not five years away. It's something we have uh, now, and it's, and it's uh, going to be uh, manufactured pretty soon, so stay tuned. I think you said something really exciting, which is, the flat screen experience will be a memory at some point. You know, it just won't be there anymore. And that's really a disruptive technology that you actually can't comprehend right now because you're so used to looking at it's, it. It's, it's really hard, right? And in any of these visual type technologies, and even VR, when VR first started, it's, you can only get so far like presenting slides to someone. This is what it looks like and feels like, right? And you have to have this truly eyes on experience. Um, and uh, just like when you first put on the initial VR, AR devices, when you put on a light field display, you have a similar uh, experience, and you should definitely come by and, and, and ch check oh, out yeah, yeah, what we have. You. Yeah. you put it on, and it's like <laughs> weird, and people put it on, and they're like, this feels weird, and then they're like, wait, this feels correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because they're just so used to seeing things in current, the current you know, head-mounted technologies that's so different than when you see light field. It's really the difference between like looking at a a TV versus like looking out the window. Like yeah. That's kind of the, the level of difference that you see. It kind of sounds soothing. It's very soothing. <laughs> sounds like my eyes are gonna get a little bit of a rest. In fact, in, in our demo room, we almost have this like very soothing, calming music. Oh, so. nice. <laughs> you had something to add, Gary? Oh, I, I think it's interesting. AR is going to uh, really shine in the next decade with kind of the mundane tasks, right? You know, VR is super exciting. You can ride a roller coaster, but you know, AR is something that you're going to use every single day. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think that's why we all see um, and we hear from like you know Mark Zuckerberg and Tim Cook, and I think all of us believe that. That's why that market is has so much larger potential than the VR market. Granted, it has a little bit more technical. Uh, it's a burden to get to a point where it's going to be truly 
you know, widely adopted and, and widely kind of mass scale. Replacing mobile phones? Replacing That's mobile phones, replacing saying? your computer. And it's funny, people say, well, you know, what are you going to use these devices for? It's like, well, what do you use your computer for? Yeah. Right? It's, it's kind of a big question to ask. It, it will be interesting to have one device. And, you know, I, I know even three or four years ago, some of the economists were saying that the size of the AR market is, you know, 100 times the size of the VR market. VR market is a great market. I love that market. But we're talking about kind of as it gets rolling because it brings the Internet to wherever you are. It is around you. Yeah, and the, and the numbers that we see are... You know they they vary wildly, right? And they're anywhere from you know 50 billion to 200 billion or something crazy, right? In the next five to 10 years. Um, but when we think about for it from a technology standpoint, we think like if you can't deliver the type of experiences that people need, the market is not going to get to that level of growth, right? If I can only show you stuff that's five feet plus away, you're not going to be able to enable the experiences to really have that kind of trajectory. Awesome. So uh, we only have a few, nine minutes left. We'll probably go over the time. Hopefully uh, there's a break after and if some people want to stay a little bit. Uh, so let's switch gears uh, in the interest of time. Let's talk about the UX and the design. So what do you think are going to be the new UX standards to emerge or, or to be created for augmented reality and mixed reality? I, I think about this a lot. Like if I could snap my fingers and have the ultimate glasses that are, intimate, are uh, infinitely small and could project um, computer graphics into the world perfectly. I'm not sure people are ready to have that experience because it's so different. I think uh, the UX and UI kind of experiences are going to have to be very familiar in these first baby steps. Like, you know, I'm always teasing our UX team because they make these UI systems that like bounce and do all kinds of cool animation. I'm like, no, 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 you got to keep it something my father would understand. Touch the big icon to launch the game. You know, I would say we're in Hollywood right now, but Hollywood hasn't done us any favors, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> you look at stuff like Minority Report where Tom Cruise is like waving his hands around. And, you know, it's, it's kind of cool to look at. And if you've tried it for like 10 or 20 seconds, it's okay. But yeah. after a while, you're just like, I'm done. My arms get tired. I, I like to uh, like draw the analogy of like mice in the uh, 90s. Like you use a computer from the 90s, you have to move a mouse really far, yeah. and then everyone got trained up to do these small gestures and these small like movements. And I think uh, our user experience is going to be an evolution like that. It's going to be a little clunky at first, and then we're going to learn how to like expedite it. And, and always the, the the simple ideas that work for people are the ones that stick. And you know we've thought a lot about. Uh, let's say that everything we want to do works. It's going to be anarchy, I mean, for a while. It's going to be stuff everywhere. And so we've thought a lot about how do you sift through that? How do you, how do you make it usable for real people? And so I think we're all thinking ahead how to solve that. But in the end, it'll be like, in, like it, when an iPhone came out, you know? There was none, and then everybody had them four years later. It was useful to people. It, it, it made their life easier. It taught them something. Yeah, I, I, would, I would add two things to that. I think one is people always have this, this habit of taking an existing UI, and when you have a new platform, just like forcing it in, like, like you know, square peg in a round hole kind of thing, right? You remember before the iPhone, there were smartphones around, and I remember all the Windows phones that had, still had the mouse cursor, still had the start <laughs> button, right? And you're literally moving the cursor around and clicking on things. And of course, that doesn't work. And I think a lot of the AR devices we're seeing today are kind of taking a similar mentality. They're saying, we can take the same icon system we have in, let's say, the iPhone or an Android phone and just replicate that in these glasses. And it doesn't really work that way. Well, it's funny because I was going to talk about Xerox coming up with the whole mouse pointer in the first place, right? And that thing's hung around for a really long time. Yeah. And I don't know what devices you, you guys have used, but one of the things I really appreciated about the uh, HoloLens is this. You know, and the sound that went with it. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, and, and I think the, actually my second point is like, you know, by providing light field technologies to people, it actually opens up the new types of user interactions they can create. You know, HoloLens is a really innovative tool, um, but I think from a user interface standpoint, because they can't display things up close, you ended up you end up like uh, interfacing with things that are generally farther away. You know, pinning things to the wall and clicking on things over here when you really want to be able to walk up to an interface and just touch it or have it at your hands, right? I think really the uh, innovation and the user experience is going to come from the developers. Yeah, I like agree. I spent a lot of time trying to look into my crystal ball and I can't figure this stuff out. You know, when we have tens of thousands of you guys like poking at this, like the, the good user experiences will surface and then they'll become the de facto standard. And one thing to, re to remember too, um, it's going to be contextual. Everything in AR is going to be contextual. It's like you might have a user interface that works great 
you know, when you're outside doing something, but, you know, when you're in your office, it might have to be a whole different one. So, um, Edward, you mentioned Minority Report. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, like you said, movies and all have done us a disservice. So, so our users are coming with certain expectations of this technology. So what are the, the hurdles that the we developers and designers need to overcome to get users into... I, know uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would start with the UI and UX because I think that's, that's, uh, that's a pretty, pretty tough one. <laughs> I think what's really important on the first devices and the first systems that come out is like what it does, it has to be rock solid, it has to, when it fails, it should be like you understand that you tricked it. If it's only 80%, you know, it's going to be frustrating. So rock solid, simple at first and then expanding from there. And I think it's going to be both. I think it's I think you say they did a disservice, but at the same time, it's eventually going to be much more than that. It's going to be much more than that way before people think it is. It's just not tomorrow or three days after tomorrow. You know, I, think, I, I think what's interesting is to look at, when you look at kind of these movies in Hollywood, is uh, identifying what are those few key use cases that's really going to be the killer use cases um, for, for people, right? Whether or not you're consumers or professional users. Um, and there's some pretty interesting stuff that we've seen in sci-fi books and, and movies, and those are all really great inspirations. I, you know, it's interesting. I look at VR and uh, like the uh, last, you know, the round of VR experimentation. We always thought that we wanted to like go through a virtual shopping mall and actually walk our avatar through. You know, in reality, I'd rather just transport into the stores. And I, I think, you know, we get stumbled up sometimes and we reinvent the wheel over and over again. But, you know, some of those things are going to get condensed down to very simple um, user experiences or maybe even using biometrics to start to predict. Um, what you want to happen in machine learning. Yeah, we start looking at things like all these diff different sensors and user interfaces. Of course, you guys have seen things like gesture tracking, and it's interesting to see stuff like eye tracking come into play. And then it gets really pretty, starts getting pretty wild, right? You start looking at, like, you think about the whole thing about minority report, like predicting yeah. something before it's going to happen. Like, that's going to start to happen with technologies like eye tracking, and it gets kind of, it can get sketchy pretty quickly, depending on how you use that kind of information, <laughs> where literally you can know somebody's intent before they do it. And depending on what you do with that information, it becomes well, pretty Well, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, we like, about, we're, yeah. we were you know, if you gaze earlier. on an icon or something, that's you, it's, you're most likely when you're engaging with it, that's when you're engaging if you're looking away. So, you know, predictive algorithms could go both ways. Yeah, I, I think it's going to help the interfaces a lot because it'll start, you'll have options and, and the software will start knowing what you want to do. It's like, I don't particularly want people knowing everything I want to do, but I like it when Netflix suggests a movie that my wife and I will like. So it goes both ways. Um, and I think in the end, it's going to be up to the users and developers on how, um, how it gets uh, implemented. I'm super fascinated with how we share information between AR devices. Like if I'm watching a YouTube video, like, do I want everyone in the world to know I'm watching a YouTube video? Do I want them to know what that YouTube content is? Like, how do we manage that? What's going to be fun is I think uh, as we develop these platforms, we're going to mess up a lot. And uh, the users are going to let us know. And I think it even goes one step further. Because when you get into VR, the biggest problem with VR was nobody had ever created a VR language. There's film language that got created a long time ago. You know how to cut a film to get people to react a certain way. One of the things I've realized doing a lot of um, the, our AR demos is things take a long time to happen because you want them to feel like they're real as if they're in real, real time. So if you start something way back there and it has to get way up here, it's not instant. Somebody's going to come up with a language to fix that. It's going to be half movie and half real life. It'll be very interesting. Great comment, Gary, you were saying about uh uh, a little bit of privacy and all that gives me an awesome segue to because we have a minute uh, and a half left about let's get uh, a little controversial. Let's close with ethical and, and social questions. So um, who owns the virtual world? Um, there's um, a, an interview by Mark Pesce uh, saying that, you know, the comment that Zuckerberg said about it would be nice to do a graffiti everywhere. So could we, you know, is it okay to deface a historical site with AR and MR. Well, I can jump in because our very first app that we put on the board when we started was a graf called Garfidi, which is a graffiti app. And my partner is a crazy person. Uh, his, uh, he's <laughs> called the Insanimator, and he would just do it everywhere. And we really realized it is anarchy to total control. It is going to be, you know, 
It's going to be controlled by what you turn on, what you turn off. Um, and, you know, just because you put something somewhere, people talk about AR landscape as if the, this real world is the AR, the Internet of Places, but there's a thousand versions of it. Like, you can have 10 people who have graffiti there, and I won't see that because I'll have clicked that I like what he does, and his will be there. It's not going to be one play space. It's going to be layer upon layer upon layer. Yeah, I think the end user is going to vote with their dollars on uh, what they're going to accept or not. And uh, I think we're going to end up in an environment of um, opt-in for a lot of this stuff, um, which is kind of what we're in now with the internet. We opt into a lot of stuff. I choose to go to Google over Yahoo because it's a cleaner interface for me. And we may go to virtual world A because it's cleaner. Yeah, I, I I think, I think uh, it, it can be very quickly become a slippery slope of, of privacy and um, user intent and actions and things like that. I mean, there's already a lot of controversy over this, a lot of these social networks today right. over like how they manipulate you, what information they use, and like you know, sub-segmenting sub different parts of the population and like targeting these people. And like today, you have a lot of control over what you do from a computer standpoint, but I think it quickly gets pretty, um, can be, can be pretty um, controversial when you get these like wearable devices. These devices can know information about you that even you're not willing to share, um, which gets pretty interesting pretty quickly. Um, so I think there's there's definitely a big question about like what kind of platforms, what kind of companies are going to have access to this type of information? What are we allow them to do? Yeah. Um, and I, it's is is it's like. It's a double-edged sword, right? We're gaining a lot of it. And there's a lot of potential benefits, but there's also we have to be very careful about, you know, what they actually use with this type of information. Like, if we think it's bad now, it's, it mm -hmm. may get a lot worse pretty but quickly. Before we came in, we were talking about this among ourselves, and it's not the graffiti on a monument that worries us. It's like um, it's the access on the back end on the analytics that will be available. And even we aren't thinking about it. Sometimes um, I was telling them that we I downloaded an app with somebody we'd been talking to, to to see how it worked and. Uh, I turned it on in my office, and my CTO, who's sitting in here somewhere, goes, turn it off, turn it off. I'm like, why? He goes, you got whiteboards all over your office with all kinds of calculations on it. It's all going to their server. They can stop and look at any one of those they want. And I'm thinking, I'm in the show Silicon Valley. <laughs> I, I think there also comes great opportunity for um, tools for the, the layman to understand what's happening to them. Like, I, we were talking about how my, my father has trouble hooking his iPad up to his router. What if he could actually see where the data is flowing visually? Like, what if you could see, like, who is manipulating you more visually? Like, when I walk by a store, like, oh, they're uh, grepping my uh, biometrics. You mean, what, what did I really agree to your, when I your, put okay? Your data coming out of you, you know? Yeah, I mean, me, who knows? <laughs> yeah, what did you really agree to when you said I agree, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is that, awesome. Right? We're out of time, unfortunately, but can I ask the, our, our, our panelists to share, you know, last, last thoughts? There's so much we couldn't, we couldn't uh, cover. We could be here for hours, I think. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited about the future. I think the next decade's going to be amazing. I think it's going to bring superpowers to all of us, and uh, can't wait to see you guys developing it. Um, I, I think... The, what I would say is that I was asked a question at one of these things, and it was a young a woman asked me, are we too late? Did we miss the boat? And I said, are you kidding? You might be a little bit too early, but you guys have an opportunity to change the face of the earth. It's up to you. I mean, I, I think about, when I think about, like, what's going to happen in the next five years to ten years, I kind of think about, like, our kids, like, what's going to happen to that generation, right? We look at the world as, as a real world. We've got, you know, carpet and wood and metal and steel and, and, uh, and glass. And there's a whole new almost material, a virtual material that's going to be out there that is just going to be, our kids are just going to think it's normal, right? And it's going to be really weird. <laughs> awesome. Thank you also the audience, everybody, for staying a few extra minutes. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists and thank them. Thank you.